another episode here today with me, Astrid, your APD. I've got Alan Aragon with me today and we're talking all things protein. And the thing is that we're going to cover quite a few things we usually ask all the time. We can get it answered by the one and only Alan. It really comes down to what works for you and how better you can adhere to it. Let me ask you something that seems to be another controversial topic. Whole eggs yeah. versus egg whites. Mm -hmm. Why, which one seems to be more optimal for hypertrophy? Because this is mm. a very common question that we yeah. get a lot. Yeah. The literature on this is very sparse. It's very... Uh, there's, there's it's literally two studies we can point to, but both studies corroborate each other. So one study is a short-term muscle protein synthesis response study. So a short-term anabolic response study that compared um, an isonitrogenous or, or a, uh, a protein matched amount of eggs, whole eggs versus egg whites. And so the whole eggs raised muscle protein synthesis to a greater degree than egg whites. And muscle protein synthesis is a short-term indicator of what might happen over time in terms of muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth. So we have that acute study showing superiority for muscle protein synthesis. And then there was a follow-up study that actually uh, took two groups and, and compared the differences in um, body composition change over time. And so we were able to really sort of see where the rubber meets the road with that particular study. And whole eggs produced more favorable body composition changes than, um, than egg whites. And, and, Interestingly, if I'm recalling correctly, there was a, um, a greater percentage of uh, lean body mass gained due to a, a more favorable effect on body fat as well with the, with the whole eggs. So, so it's some interesting stuff. So we, we have two studies to look at. Um, I wouldn't put a huge amount of stock in the idea that your egg serving for the day, whether it's whole or, or whole eggs or whether it's egg whites, is going to make or break a whole program. But if we're just asking this question and looking at this question in isolation, the facts and the data point towards the superiority of whole eggs over egg whites for um, changes in the anabolic response as well as changes in body composition over time. At the end of the day, I would guess it, it, you have to look at your entire diet to begin with. Mm -hmm. And obviously your total protein intake over just single foods but yes. obviously when you're saying specifically let's look at this question mm -hmm. if eggs were the only thing you ate right i guess that would be the answer now yep. another question that gets very very common is pre-bed protein intake mm -hmm. for hypertrophy mm -hmm. especially calcium seems to be very popular yep. nowadays is that under or overrated um that's a good question and I would say that it sort of depends on the population. Kind of depends on the population you're, you're looking at. Uh, for like 90 plus percent of the general population, it's a it's a total non-concern. It's a non-concern. Overrated then. But for <laughs> the, the that minority of folks who are trying to push limits with um, either muscle growth or muscle retention then generally speaking, a slow digesting, high quality protein source that is easily, easily consumed um, would fit the profile for what, what would be ideal as a pre-bed protein um, snack or protein feeding. And casein, it fits all the criteria for that type of protein at that time. And so, um, once again, people who are trying to push the limits of muscle growth and muscle retention, um, they might just be ever so slightly better off having a, a hit of casein pre-bed than they would having a hit of uh, a, a more quickly um, absorbed protein. Now the differences are, are going to be pretty minuscule and when you look at the actual literature, the differences are super small. but. Um, but if a lot is on the line, if contests are on the line, if endorsements are on the line, if there's a lot at stake, then um, 
yeah, you could, you can make a case for for casein being being a superior choice for um for a pre bed protein hit or at least a blend of casein and, and a fast digesting protein for that purpose. That's my non simple answer to that one. If would if you don't have actual supplements, could you put the same statement for sources of casein that are coming from foods? that still make the job? Oh yeah, yeah. Do the job, right? Yeah, um, one example that, that I could use, that I, I've used, is um, Greek yogurt, so, or, or phage, or phaye, uh, something along those lines. Um, a, yo like a yogurt product that doesn't have a lot of extra added, added stuff to, to make it sweet and to make it taste good. Uh, what I've done is I, I've taken fat-free Greek yogurt and just flavor it up and sweeten it up with whey. And then you've got pretty much, you know, the, the, the best of both worlds there with, with a, with a pre-bed type of a protein hit where you've got that, the slow digesting component and then you've got the wild, the wild side of whey. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to buy a casein protein powder to achieve these theoretical benefits that, that really would only, only benefit people in, in the athletic and, and, and physique world anyway. Now, let me go and ask you all another question that I think you might, you might like this question, cool. uh, but I'm not too sure whether you get a lot asked about this. So with in the same line of private protein, mm -hmm. in the case of diabetics, like someone who has type 2 diabetes or, or like just diabetics in general, why it is suggested to have protein and carb-based meal just before bed? Is there any rational behind this? Um, feel free if you feel like it's too much. You can you can just say um, something very very simple according to what you know about it. This is kind of an old school recommendation within the dietetics profession, where the origin of it was to get um, diabetics, type two diabetics in particular to try to get them to include more proteins with their meals, which traditionally are just one huge hit of carbs. Whether it's a big ass pasta dish, a big ass rice dish, just a big ass stack of pancakes for breakfast, or, or even just like, you know, two pieces of toast and some orange juice and <laughs> some milk and then some cereal on the side. That's just how, how the general public tends to eat. And um, it's not ideal for type 2 diabetics to be doing that. So the or whole origin, getting protein in with each meal, get the protein with the carbohydrates. It's, it's not really a question of combining protein and carbohydrates. Uh, and even at the pre-bed point, it's just more uh, um, a matter of please reduce the, the carbohydrate in, in, in your meals and balance it out with at least some protein. So I think that's, well, that's my, my uh, perspective of, of how that came about. Yeah, yeah, you, you might have a different sense. perspective being in the clinical uh, side of things. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense to to have that perspective of well, it's just a matter of getting more protein in. Find out that perhaps another rational could be like if you're eating protein with carbohydrates, you might be reducing the carbohydrate load. You mentioned that, uh, but also like protein might have an effect of reducing glycemic index when you're combining two things together. So it just kind of makes it a little bit lower effect on the insulin spike. I guess that's another perhaps pro about it. There, there are hypothetical and theoretical benefits for, for that, but I, I just don't see the strong case for, to do it for, uh, yeah. for diabetics. But I, I see the, the hypotheticals. Okay. Well, now is the consideration of the sex difference for determining protein mm -hmm. overrated or underrated? In the case that, like, is there any other more important variable that you should pay attention to when it comes to determining requirements for protein yeah. over that, that one? Yeah, the, the limited amount of literature that we have on that topic so we can, we can look at things from a, a hypothetical or theoretical standpoint, and then we can look at things from um, a practical standpoint. So those are two kind of different things. And what ultimately matters is what you can carry out practically, even though it might, might help to know the theoretical stuff too. So um, the literature is very mixed 
on whether or not women and men have different protein requirements. Um, there is some research showing that older women have um, a lesser rate of uh, muscle loss or lean body mass loss than men. And they might just be, w women might just be uh, actually superior at retaining muscle tissue. And, and women are actually superior in, in a number of ways physiologically to men. And, and um, who knows what the, uh, uh, the anthropological, uh, the, the, how would you call it? the uh, the bio <laughs> anthropological reasons for that? Um, I think that it, it might be more important for um, women to be able to survive longer, so they can take take care of us guys <laughs> and the babies, right? Um, but I I would no. There there is some data showing that women can do better on on lower protein amounts in terms of uh, lean body mass retention than men. Um, there there are some data showing that. Um, the amount of protein that women require to max out even training adaptations, resistance training adaptations, is slightly lower than men. When you look at this on a per unit of lean body mass basis, um, so so if we were to take so so that that's the theory. The theory is women actually require slightly less protein than men when you're looking at grams of protein required per kilogram of lean body mass. There, so, now we go from theoretical to the practical. Do we have to nitpick over that when we're prescribing protein amounts? And the answer is probably not. Um, the range that happens to be effective for both sexes is somewhere between 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of total body weight. And that range covers, that's, pretty, that's a pretty broad range. And so that's gonna cover the needs of people who require quite a bit less protein versus people who um, are kind of pushing the limits and, and require quite a bit more. And the body is very flexible and forgiving with what it can succeed on and thrive on with respect to protein dosing. So if we, if we take the, the idea that all your body really needs for your goals is let's say 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight but you happen to chronically run like 2 2.0 um, grams per kilogram or 2.2 it's not like that's going to hurt you health wise um, it's not like that's necessarily gonna hurt you performance wise unless you're somebody who really it requires a certain amount of carbohydrate intake and you're trying to economize on total calories that you consume so Theoretically, women need a little bit less. Practically, okay. it doesn't it doesn't make much much difference to program them the same. Uh, women have um, sometimes it, it's very common for women to have uh, double the body fat of men uh, in terms of proportion. Okay, not not absolute not necessarily absolute amounts, but in terms of proportion. So therefore, they have um, significantly less lean body mass proportion wise than men. So if we say in absolute terms that women and men, they just have the same protein requirements, that's not necessarily true. But from a practical standpoint, it doesn't tend to uh, harm people to overdo protein a little bit if you're prescribing the same amount of protein for men and women, and women are uh, slightly overeating their protein. So what I do is I tend to start off at, at the lower end of the optimal range, depending on the, the person's goal, if it's a woman. So I'm not throwing women on a gram per pound right off the bat, regardless, you know what I mean? I, I'm starting more on the 0.7 grams per pound, to, you know, the 1.6 grams per kilo part of the range for women. And, and then just, you know, working up from there as necessary. And, and depending on the goal too, it, it, you always have to look at the individual um, and then just kind of work their program from the individual needs and goals. Now you mentioned lean body mass. Yeah. In your opinion, what is best in terms of determining protein requirements? Using grams per kilogram mm -hmm. of lean body mass mm -hmm. or grams per kilogram of total body weight? Yeah, the, that, that's a good question and, and that's something that really confuses people. Mm. Because the only time that you would have to really worry about whether you're, you're talking about lean body mass 
versus uh, total body mass is if you're looking at the, street, the extreme ends of overweight and, and underweight. So um, usually uh, in the literature that has generated these figures, this, this magical 1.6 grams per, per kilogram of body weight, that was mostly done in average lean-ish uh, men and women, mostly men. Uh, so you can be pretty confident that you can apply that 1.6 to, to 2.2 if you're you know, really trying to push limits. You can be pretty confident about applying that to total body weight if you are not substantially overweight or substantially underweight. In the case that you're you're on the on the more extreme ends of under or overweight, then you you could look at what um, people at what clinicians call ideal body weight, or what might be a little more easily looked at as target body weight. So what I tend to, I, there, there are ways to estimate ideal body weight, but uh, in my experience, they all tend to shoot pretty low um, from, for a, a lot of people in the, in the fitness realm who carry more lean body mass because they lift, you know, they lift, they lift more than their fingers. So, so those, those formulas for lean body mass tend to shoot low. So uh, I, I have a tendency to have people base protein intake on their targeted body weight or their target body weight instead of their current body weight if they happen to be far from where they want to be um, body weight wise on, on either direction overweight or underweight and I guess it also helps to like if you don't have or have any idea of what is your current body total body fat percentage mm -hmm. it is just going to be much easier to utilize total body weight or an estimate a roughly estimate because you might just not know exactly what your lean body mass is to begin with to multiply it by the protein factor you want to achieve. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And even if you did estimate it or measure it, we know you can't measure, truly measure body fat, you're, you're, you're estimating it. Well, yeah, you can measure it, but that would require things that you, you wouldn't survive, right? So, yeah, even if you were to to put it through a DEXA scan or, a, or an in-body scan or something sophisticated like that, um, even um, things like uh, calipers or any estimate that you would choose, it's still an educated guess. And yeah. even with, with things like DEXA showing individual errors, you know, at these, these disturbingly high numbers, uh, in some cases, you just have to kind of take, you have to take that with a grain of salt and know that you really aren't going to get a truly accurate assessment or prediction of your body composition unless you do something like the four compartment model, which is yeah. just highly unfeasible for, for most people. And, and it's not even necessary outs, outside of the lab setting anyway. So, so yeah, target body weight is just fine to use. Um, if you want to run a formula for ideal body weight, that's fine too. I, I tend to think they run low but target body weight would be it. Or your current body weight if you're cool with maintenance. Okay, if you only had one meal a day, mm -hmm. which is a common question we get a lot, <laughs> are you screwed <laughs> to, like if you wanted to build muscle or, or just get some gains, yeah. are you screwed? Not really, not really. Um, and, and, and I would say it, it depends on the population and, and it depends on the stakes. So that, that's a common way that I, I, I respond to, to provocative questions like that. Uh, you know, I kind of respond by saying, okay, what's the population and what's at stake? So if we're talking about a regular old bro who's trying to not embarrass himself <laughs> at, the, at the public pool or at the uh, apartment complex pool, then, you know, yeah, you can get away with one meal a day, that's fine. Uh, now, if you're talking about an athlete, are you talking about somebody who's competitive or somebody who's been training a while and they are fe they're feeling like they're past the newbie stage, past the intermediate stage, and they're coming into territory where they, you know, they want to put a, another, who knows, quarter inch on their guns and the guns are already stretching the sleeves and they want a little more. Um, they, they, they want a little more muscle mass and they know that they're already 
um, they already carry more muscle mass than the average average Joe. You know, they go in the gym; they're one of the bigger dudes. Um, yeah, those guys are not necessarily going to be served very well with a with a one meal a day thing. Not necessarily. Uh, and the reasons for that are both technical and 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 practical. You know, the technical reasons would be that there appears to be a limit for a muscle protein synthesis per protein dose. So the so-called muscle full effect uh, happens when protein synthesis rises as a result of protein dosing, and then it falls within within a three-hour period. So the rising part takes like one to two hours, and then the falling part takes about an hour. And this happens in spite of a persistent elevation of circulating amino acids in the blood. So that's the so-called muscle full effect. That's referring to muscle protein synthesis. And there appear there appears to be that ceiling. Like regardless, I, I mean, you can just load up with uh, 200 grams of protein in a single sitting, and muscle protein synthesis will rise, and then it'll drop back down at at the three hour mark. And that's just the nature of the beast. Now there are, are limits to the um, the physiological phenomena that we can measure simultaneously. Like it, it's it's a logistical pain in the butt to try to measure protein synthesis and breakdown. So we just kind of skip the breakdown part and assume that muscle protein breakdown is only a small part of the equation, and the major part would be muscle protein synthesis, which seems to be true, and that's why we just kind of depend on it and kind of sweep muscle protein breakdown under the rug. But that sweeping MPB under under the rug is, is is done partially out of convenience and partially because it's a pain in the butt to to uh, to measure. Okay, but tying my my answer together, tying my answer together. If you have casual goals and there's no pressing or urgent need to maximize muscle growth, like if if you want to retain muscle, I think most people can retain muscle on one meal a day. I don't really think they can. Uh, however, if you're going to so. Yeah, go so, ahead. So, hang on. So, in that case, how low, of, in terms of grams of protein per kilogram body weight, can you actually go before you experience muscle loss, or like you're actually start getting a little bit too low? How low would be too low? Of course, that's not an easy answer because it depends on how how lean, or it depends on the person's baseline body composition. So. If you're taking somebody at baseline who's already lean, you know, and you put them on low protein, and you put them on in hypocaloric conditions, then a sizable proportion of their loss is going to come from lean body mass. So, on the flip side, if you take somebody with a lot of body fat, then、um, their proportion of lean mass loss and their net losses in lean mass will be will be lower. Because the body has some energy storage to draw from in order to survive the, the diet, so、yeah. um, so it really depends. If somebody's already lean, how low can they go? Hypocaloric conditions on one meal a day.、Uh, I would cast my my bets on、mm, if you want to optimize. I wouldn't go below one point six grams per kilo. Yeah, it is kind of a magic number. This one point six because it it happens to. Cause muscle gain in, re- in regular folks, and it happens to be good for muscle retention in folks who、uh, aren't necessarily <laughs> w- wanting to be just just regular, and they're trying to diet all the time. So now、um, the、yeah. point I wanted to ask you, like, if let's say the protein is lower, but calories are normal, you're in a normal normal caloric state.、Mm-hmm. Okay. How low can you go? Even if your calories are decently stable, and along the same question, would there be any difference in terms of lean muscle res- retention if you compare someone who does like endurance training versus resistance training, and being in a low protein intake state but adequate calorie intake? Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so complicated. No, no, no. That that that's fine. That's fine.、Um, There, there's some interesting research that that looked at cyclists in、um, just a five-day snapshot of、um, a, a nitrogen balance study, and 
looking at the individual data, all the subjects were 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 fine. They were they were okay at um, close to two grams per kilogram of uh, of body weight, and they were not in a dieting state. Now these were competitive cyclists. Now one of the competitive cyclists was in a negative nitrogen balance, in spite of having a protein intake close to two grams per kilogram, and so okay. the. The authors speculated, based on their calculations, that in order for her to be at least zero balance or, or push it slightly above in the positive nitrogen balance, to indicate that you know there, there's no muscle or lean tissue loss going on, the hypothetical uh, amount was that she would need to consume 2.8 uh, grams per kilogram. So, okay. um, so the the problem with you know with this question is is like we have to once again we have to look at the population. Are we talking about athletes, or are we talking about regular folks, casual folks, weekend warriors? So it, it does make a difference. It does make a difference if if we're talking about competitive athletes. Um, you know this this magic range of one point six to two point two grams per kilogram of body weight. Depending on the stakes of of the competition, uh, depending on, on on how high level uh, of a competition you're talking about, then if it's endurance or resistance trainees, I would push more towards above two grams per kilogram. I would I would push between um, between two and three if it's a competitive situation. If you're you're in Maintenance conditions, non-dieting conditions, and you're not a competitive uh, person, and you're not trying to win trophies or be extraordinary in any way. Then I, I can see um, I can see 1.6 being the low end for um, resistance trainees and endurance trainees, and you could potentially coax me into the realm of uh, as low as 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight if. Um, if the person just, you know, has has issues with consuming lots of protein, whether it's psychological issues, or whether it, it just doesn't yeah. fit with with their preference, and they they have a, this huge affinity towards um, the other macronutrients, and they feel a lot better on it. If somebody is running 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight, and they're not losing lean body mass, and all indicators are showing that their performance is thriving as well, I don't have an issue with that. I just don't see it. I just don't see it happening much below 1.2, below 1.2 to 1.6. And with anybody competitive, I would push them towards 1.6, even in uh, even yeah. in non-dieting conditions. I completely agree. And I guess this this question comes a lot because there's the, this general recommendation of just just aim for the RDA 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that's where I kind of thought asking this question because. Like if that is kind of the minimum recommendation that people like the RDA, the point point eight grams per kilogram is is so low. Like, why? What's the point of the RDA to begin with? Is if you shouldn't go below, like, less than, like being very very optimistic, one point two grams, yeah. like you mentioned. Yeah. Like, what's the point? Yeah. That the answer to that is that there is no point. <laughs> there is no point. The, the RDA is an outdated figure. Uh, it's based largely on um, sedentary folks and using the, the crude technology of, of nitrogen balance, which um, there's research, this was a, thinking of the, the research of Wahlberg, um, 1988 study by, by Wahlberg, not Marky Mark, but a different Wahlberg, um, showing that, showing lean body mass losses in the face of, of, of positive nitrogen balance. So nitrogen balance is not necessarily an accurate marker of uh, bodily protein status. Um, so yeah, yeah, there, the, the RDA is definitely outdated and especially when you look at studies, several studies that compare the RDA with double the RDA on various clinical and non-clinical measures double the RDA always beats the RDA, whether it be for um, effects on body composition um, or whether it be for effects on even even things like uh, um, cardiovascular risk markers. 
So, um, yeah, there, there's just the evidence has really piled up against the RDA over the past 30, 40 years. So, um, yeah, the RDA kind of needs to go. Now, I want to throw in this caveat. If somebody is in in a hypercaloric state or just persistently trying to gain weight, and uh, let's imagine that um, they're, they're, they already uh, have, a, have a pretty high body weight, but they just want to gain more or maintain, then hypothetically, the RDA is fine for that person. You know, because they're they're basing it off their total body weight, and if their total body weight is on the high end, then their absolute protein intake is going to be just fine. It's not going to be threateningly low anyway. So if this person is maintaining and at a high body weight, they they enjoy that. That's that's their thing. Then the RDA will suit them just fine. But anybody who is trying to lose body weight, lose body fat, improve um, athletic performance, or preserve lean body mass under physically active conditions, which is most of us, you know, we're, most of us are physically active and most of us are, are trying to at least preserve our lean body mass. And then the RDA just is suboptimal. It's not catastrophic, it's, but for most people, it's suboptimal. It's not gonna do the job great. Let's see if we can do it. Okay. Well, let's okay. finish, let's finish okay. strong, yeah? Let's, let's give the people more than they bargained for. Apart from whey protein, are you aware of any protein supplement type that might do as good job as whey eliciting MPS? For example, uh, pea protein or beef protein, soy protein, casein. What are your thoughts about this? The, oh man, it's, it's tough to beat whey. <clears throat> it's tough to beat whey for MPS. It's tough to beat whey for the acute anabolic response because whey has um, a high proportion of essential amino acids. And of the essential amino leucine. acids, it has a high proportion of, of the branch chain amino acids, leucine in particular. Um, so it's got those key anabolic drivers that are really going to be superior for uh, muscle protein synthesis. Um, however, uh, the soy does elicit a, a high MPS response. Um, pea protein has a decent response as well, and there's actually one study showing that pea protein actually beat whey for increasing muscle thickness. Um, so that that's an interesting anomaly. That I, I tend to look at that as as a one hit wonder for the time being, um, because either uh, there's some kind of magic going on with pea pea, pea protein, or there is uh, some kind of shenanigans going on with the setup of um, the funding source uh, and who knows it, there there could be some commercial bias in there but I don't like to dismiss studies on the basis of a funding source but uh, yeah I'm kind of keeping an eye on pea protein be, ever, ever since that 2015 uh, ish study I believe it was that did a head-to-head -head comparison with whey pea protein and pea ended up edging protein uh, whey protein out a little bit it was it's Pretty interesting stuff, um, but it seems like potato protein seems to be like very new. But it seems like it is really good to to just get your the job done. Yes. Have you heard about that? Yes, there there's potato protein, there's corn protein, um, there is uh, mycoprotein, which is a fungus based protein, and all of these things are are just being compared with 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 whey protein because whey is kind of the standard um yeah. but I, I i take these these results with a grain of salt because what really kind of counts is replication of longitudinal designs and adaptations to resistance training over time and whey protein has the strongest track record of, um, of results yeah. in studies that are carried out over a series of weeks and months where we're looking at these longer term adaptations. Um, but it, it's always interesting to look at short term anabolic response because you can, you can put a, a tight degree of control on all the variables and it shows you kind of a micro mechanistic snapshot of what happens in, in the short term, which, you know, if, if you can corroborate that with long term adaptations, then you have a strong evidence base and you have you can build a strong case for that particular protein 
So um, I'm not, I'm not convinced that um, that way has been dethroned. Uh, I think that maybe the only way that you could possibly kick things up a notch is by blending way and casein. Um, but then again, you're looking at a, a short-term response on one of your on a small percentage of protein of your protein sources for the day anyway. So um, we are really we are kind of really nitpicking over here. But but hey, we're we're in the business of, of nitpicking the details anyway, so it's fun. Let me ask you the last question. Okay. Um, if collagen is considered a low quality protein, does that make this supplement useless? Yeah, I, I used to think so. I used to think so before before I dove into the the literature on the topic because. Uh, and, and I'm sure you, you can relate to this as we are going through our nutrition degrees and the undergrad, especially we learn what the, the high quality proteins are and what the low quality proteins are, what the so-called complete proteins are, and what the so-called incomplete proteins are. And collagen always got thrown in the low quality slash incomplete pile because it's missing tryptophan. And so um, it always traditionally has been dismissed as kind of the... <laughs> Kind of the whack protein out of the animal sources which were all these you know shining shining examples of high quality protein with the when, when you look at dairy and, and, and meat and fish and all, all, all those guys all the animal sources and egg you know egg, egg was also a worshipped protein source as well while collagen was always thrown away but it wasn't until i don't know maybe the last decade ish where the the collagen research just started accumulating and showing benefits for um, non-muscle lean tissues. So uh, collagen is unique among protein sources in that it has a uniquely high amount of, of glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, and a higher amount of arginine actually, compared to other protein sources. And so that combo clicks really well with um, joint adaptations, skin adaptations, hair, and um, uh, other applications as in addition to that. And there is a small body of literature showing that collagen actually um, can, can help with some muscular adaptations as well, but it's hard to disentangle increases in total protein um, versus the isolated effects of collagen itself on, on muscle tissue. There have been a couple of direct comparisons of uh, collagen versus whey on skeletal muscle, human skeletal muscle adaptations and whey. Whey is the more anabolic protein at the muscle level than collagen, but Collagen does have a very strong evidence base for um, alleviating certain clinical conditions, osteoarthritis, um, just joint pain in general. There's a, an interesting body of its positive effects on, on skin integrity as well. And so, um, and ligaments, tendons, th that sort of thing. There's quite a bit of literature and, and most of it's positive. And you can look at it cynically and, and say that, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, but it's probably probably a, a biased set of data, or you can be open-minded and say, well, it actually does kind of make sense that if we're going to feed the tissues that we're trying to target with the actual raw materials that make up those tissues, then collagen would be a, a logical choice to supplement the diet with if you want to use it for therapeutic purposes. So so yeah, it, it's, the collagen literature has gotten to a point where the evidence is more than just uh, raising an eyebrow and turning some heads. It's uh, it's come to a point where okay. we need to give it some serious consideration. Have you found in the literature any specific recommendation in terms of amounts that you should be aiming for in a day if you decided to utilize yeah. collagen protein? Um, is there any specific recommendations in, in the amounts? Uh, the effective dosing ranges, they range from 8 to 12 grams to 8 to 15, 8 to 15 grams a day. Okay. And so that's kind of the safe zone if you want to, if you want to play with the uh, um, potential uh, effects of, of collagen and it's really hard to actually tell and see if anything's working whenever you whenever you try these things out but um, like I said the, the literature is strong enough um, to warrant giving these things a try. Should you be taking collagen with some type of vitamin C mm -hmm. to increase the potentiation of those proteins from collagen or or it's not necessary? There's a small body of literature showing that there is um, an enhancing effect of uh, a combination of collagen and, and vitamin C. Uh, yeah. But lo looking at your diet as a whole, like if somebody is, is 
eating vitamin C sources through the course of a day, um, and they just happen to throw their collagen on, on top of that, they probably wouldn't necessarily benefit from having C and collagen at the same time. Um, although I don't see that, how, that, that wouldn't hurt, might help. Um, but yeah, there is some literature on the co-ingestion of vitamin C and collagen and uh, joint integrity, tendons, ligaments, joints. Okay, perfect. Alan, what some projects do you have for the future? Ah, I'm writing a book. <laughs> I'm writing another book. Another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Writing another book. Tell me a little bit of, like, could you tell us a little a sneak peek of it? Oh. What it's all about? Um, it's about, it's just about the, the magic of, um, of, of g gummy forms of uh, apple cider vinegar. It's the, ma that's mm -hmm. the whole book. That's the entire book. I talk about how if you take apple cider vinegar uh, in between meals and just like gummy pill form, your okay. all of your life's problems will be solved. It gone right, within okay. days. So you know you'll you'll just look a lot better, and, and your your all of your life's problems will disappear. That's what my book's about. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's going to be a hit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's what I'm told. That's what I'm told. But no, in, in all seriousness, I uh, I am writing a book and. Um, it's it's far from being finished, so uh, there'll be there'll be more stuff that that will drop uh, before that that book happens. But um, I haven't written a book um, as a sole author since two thousand seven. It, it is it, it is a, a deal with a big publisher. They're going to be putting the book together, and and I'm going to be obviously in charge of the, the content of the book. But it's not one of those things where I could just get it done and get it out to my audience. You know, I'm working with a company now, uh, with with, the, with this this publishing company. But there's a bit more of an autonomous feel with with this book. Like I'm, I have the final say in every little aspect of this 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 book, man. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I feel like I'm I'm in a good position to make um, some really good good waves and, and make some uh, make some positive impacts on on the on the industry and on our, our, our narrow niche here in, in the science-based, evidence-based, common sense, um, use, your, use your brain based uh, community. So yeah, I, I'm excited. Alan, do you know you always do. Do you know you always do. Trying, you know, that's all we can do. Just, just, just try our best. And yeah, I'm just, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm still knee deep in, in doing my monthly research review. So um, yeah, that's, that's what my life is right now. It's, it's research review and work on the book. And try to keep up with the uh, research um, collaborations that that come my way. And I'm collaborating on on a paper with uh, my friend Saint Bradley Schoenfeld, and uh, I'm I happen to be the first author on this paper, which is a special thing for me because I never it never was my goal to be authoring peer reviewed papers when when I was um, trying to make my way up the the career ladder in in this fitness and nutrition career space. You know so. So I think it's a, it's, it's a real blessing and a real incredible opportunity. Um, the last time I was the first author on a paper was in 2013. So okay. we're going to have an eight-year span <laughs> since this, this happened. So th those, are, those are big things, big deals to me. So, so that paper, I have another paper uh, going through peer review um, with Chris Barakat and uh, Scott Stevenson, um, Jaime, uh, I mean, Jaime, uh, Guillermo uh, Escalante, and um I'm Guillermo, Guillermo. <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, you, you know you know I'm, I'm all you know I'm all, all yankied out with my with my accents That's okay. so, <laughs> so it's you know I've got some stuff that's 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 gonna drop and I'm excited okay. about it and I'm just super busy and yeah I, training I, from home yes yes training from home okay. it's nice to train close to the fridge uh I don't miss the window you know don't miss the anabolic window Oh, that's that's important one. Hey, <laughs> yep. But but yeah, no. Th this this has been great, Astrid. Thank you for inviting me and getting me in front of your audience. Uh, thank you all for watching this. Really appreciate that, and thank you for the great questions that, that you sent over. And yeah, it's it's been definitely fun. Uh, you're you're doing great things in the industry, Astrid. I, I'm super duper happy for you, and and uh, it's been really great to to see your audience grow to pretty dang uh, gigantic proportions. And it's great to continue to see um, your climb through the industry ranks, and and um, it's great to see your reach expand. So it's really cool. Uh, you're one, I, you're, I you're one of the good. I, you're one of the good folks. You're one of the good guys. So I try to I try to show up every day. That's what I do. And like my goal is to make a small difference every day in someone's life. 
that's I think that's the goal of everyone who really has a good intention to make a difference. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of keep showing up and just just trying to make sure I am making a difference in the industry. That's that's all I want want to out out of this. Yeah. So yeah, are you are you going to make a, a book by any chance about um, apple cider vinegar? Are you going to jump on that train? <laughs> Not really. I'm not interested in apple cider vinegar. I want. I am interested in lemon water. <laughs> I think that one is a very, very good. One. That might be a better meat. What about especially removing? How about, what about with some celery juice in there? Would that would that work oh, out? Celery. It would be hard because I don't like celery. Mm -hmm. So if I have to try it, um, oh, okay. it nah, right. nah, celery is not. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. No. You were able to keep a straight face. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to assign my audience to head over to your channel and like it, subscribe, share it, that whole deal. So yeah, you're doing good things. Thank you so much for this guest spot and thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, Alan, we made it. We made it with no interruptions. <laughs> there was, it was good. I couldn't believe it. The stars are lined up, man. This we is awesome. <laughs> Have a good day or good night and I'll see you very soon. Take care, Astrid. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for being watching. I appreciate you so much. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any questions or any comments, please comment below and I'll be sure I'll answer to this as soon as I can. I, I want to thank you for inviting me on and I want to thank everybody out there, YouTubers, YouTubers, what, hold back on the dislikes, you know, make sure you like and subscribe and, and, you know, be <laughs> put on your, put on your uh, uh, best manners in the comments, right? So.